we are live, Orlando. Welcome to The Hero's Journey. Yet again, I am your co-host, <laughs> DJ Ratbone. I'm joined by Jacoby and a guest of the show, Ken Stringfellow. Yay. He is. I'm just going to start off the show here and uh, perform a little tune for you. I'd love to do that. All right. Everybody ready? Yep. Because you would rather wake up alone Just wake me. <laughs> and that was one morning off yeah. of your 2001 album, Touched. Indeed. What a morning it was. Oh, yeah. You've got a little bit of a break, and then you've got your West Coast dates. Yes. I mean, in between, I'm producing a band in Boise, and I'm working on my <laughs> band's album in Seattle. And so not so much of a break, but just a change of pace or a change of scenery, shall we say, from the live to the studio, but still working. And then, yeah, then I've got another 20 dates on the West Coast and then dates in the UK and Ireland and Belgium and France and Spain uh, and some shows at the end of the year. And yeah, the hits keep coming. So you're busy now. Super busy, but having a great time. Okay. So, you know, what most people would know you from is the Posies and then R.E.M. Mm -hmm. um, but how many other bands are you attached to at the moment? At the moment? Well, I mean... At the moment, it's pretty much just the posies and um, solo work. I mean, R.E.M. disbanded in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also involved in the band Big Star, who were mm -hmm. originally from the 70s, from Memphis. Um, and I helped kind of put them back together in the 90s and played with them. But uh, the singer Alex Chilton passed away in 2010. So that that came to an end, sadly. Um, but I've been involved in lots of things. Uh, I estimate I'm on about 250 albums as either an artist or a producer or uh, like a session dude <laughs> or an arranger <laughs> or a mixer or whatever. Um, I've been, you know, doing this for 31 years. So have built up pretty large body work. I, I'm a really hard worker. 
I like working on lots of stuff, and so here I am. Yeah, you can do the math. Uh, uh, 250 records in 31 years, that's, that's pretty intense. Yeah, I mean, and there are years where I was on tour almost the whole year, so sometimes I'm doing like working on like 20 albums in one year. Wow. And then maybe sometimes it's under 10, but I'm always working on something. Do you find it's uh, easy to always just bring that passion for music and passion for what you're creating every time? Isn't it weird? Because uh, that is the most fair question to ask. Uh, and the answer is yeah. Um, I think I get even more enthusiastic as time goes on just because, um, you know, not everybody can sustain a 30-year career and have people stay interested in it and stuff like that. I know lots of great musicians uh, who started out when I started out who don't play anymore because just, you know, nobody's interested in what they're doing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't take that kind of good fortune for granted. Um, but I'm not just here because, oh my gosh, you know, I should be so appreciative. I mean, I am very grateful, but I also just love what I do. So maybe that enthusiasm rubs off on people too. Um, I hope it does, you know, when I'm working in the studio with people that, um, that, 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 you know, I'm as, I'm as into their record as they are, I believe at that time, you know, and, uh, that, that, that kind of attention, um, helps them feel good and helps them, gives them confidence. That's kind of one of my jobs as a producer, mm -hmm. for example. But yeah, I'm really into it. Even, you know, on this tour, as I mentioned, you know, I've, uh, I played 27 shows as of tonight, I will have anyway, and had one day off, which was just the day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, driving and doing all the emails and, you know, coming into radio stations <laughs> and uh, and doing the show. And it's, the, you know, playing that same album every night. Even I was worried, like, okay, playing the same album, <laughs> 50 shows, I don't know. what's, And it's really cool, actually. Yeah. It's never the same twice. Exactly. And it's never the same audience. So it, it like, it reinvents itself every night. It's mm -hmm. very odd, but it, it's been... Um, just so much fun, continues to be. So let's actually talk about this album, Touched. Mm -hmm. uh, this came out on September 11th, 2001. Yeah, and the very September 11th. And so it it has that attached to it. And so- Forever. What, and, and you've talked about, you know, how that has in a way kind of redefined the meaning of that album. For sure. Could you kind of expand on that? Well, for, first of all, there, you know, there are people who bought that album at the time, um, you know, people who were into the Posies or into my first solo album or some combination at that time and um, who were anticipating this album. And even though, you know, just most of the, uh, you know, just such a weird thing to have September 11th come and uh, September 11th would be a weird thing no matter what, mm -hmm. a very unfortunate and terrible day. Um, but yes, my record came out that day, but some people were still anticipating it. So they knew it was coming. And so they were able to get it. Whereas, you know, the other promotional efforts were kind of <laughs> on hold, shall we say. Um, but, uh, I think for a lot of people that record, um, fits strangely well with the way people were feeling at that time. It's, it's not a totally depressing record. So it's not something that's so down that you're like, you're feeling down and you don't want to put that on because it's just going to make it worse. It's not so up that it ignores the concept that people go through bad things. Yeah. It's kind of got a mix. And I think that mix was delivered in such a way that it, 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 it was like soft medicine for those times uh, for a certain group of people. I mean, we're talking a small amount of people. I don't know how many people bought that record, 20, 30, 40, 50,000. We're not talking about millions of people here. That doesn't really matter. What matters is, is that to those people, this record really became something that they really attached to because they, you know, they needed a place to go with, I mean, nobody, we'd never seen anything like September 11th in mm -hmm. our lifetime. And, you know, uh, there was maybe Pearl Harbor in my, you know, grandparents', grandparents time, yeah. but not in our lifetime. Um, so it was, uh, there was a lot of things, you know, just a lot of places to go with those feelings. Um, and I think one of the nice things about music is um, even if you don't, even if you're not in the same room uh, with the musician or other fans, I mean, music creates a kind of community mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has that potential. And of course, now that, I mean, you know, 2001 was a 
the internet too. existed and things like that, but yeah. the internet communities were not yet to the same level that mm-hmm. social media is now. Um, and so, and music is part of like almost every like community, like social media community. Mm-hmm. People are always talking about music and shows and stuff. It's only expanded, but it was kind of true then too. But music was even like, you know, maybe what do they say? Like beer was the first social network. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> music was right after, mm-hmm. you know, music is like the social network before the internet for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, also I went on tour at that time, which mm-hmm. is a very interesting thing to do and, mm-hmm. and maybe foolish on paper, but it, uh, in practice, it was a really beautiful thing to do. A lot of people canceled their tours around that time because mm-hmm. nobody knew if it was safe to travel and or even possible for that first week because all the flights were grounded. And um, I got out of Seattle just a few days after 9-11 and went to the East Coast and played, and including playing New York on September 20th. And it was a great, it was it was a great moment in a in a terrible time. Mm-hmm. It was it was something really, um, I don't know. People really, this music worked in that context, and it and these songs grew into something bigger than I intended. Would you say it's a record that represents like healing in a way? That having the mix of um, sadness from um, a recent pain, but having the the optimism and spirit to, to grow and move from it? You know what, I, th- I think it does. Um, and e- even though it might not sound that way when you're listening to it, there is kind of a, there's a lot of up and down, mm-hmm. yeah. but I think the overall arc is, no one can see my hand gestures, by the way. <laughs> the, you know, the overall, just, it's just between us. Yeah. They're not obscene. We, we, they're we very, know. <laughs> they're mathematical hand gestures. I'm trying to illustrate the arc here. Um, but by the end of the record, uh, it goes in a very positive direction by the very end with the song called Here's to the Future. Um, And I would say that on the micro scale, me making that record and writing those songs, I think I had been in a kind of a down place and I came out of it. And somehow, even though that's not, it's not like I wrote that in the liner notes or Mm -hmm. anything like that. um, Somehow I think that intention can like, was transmitted through this music and people actually picked up on that. And so the emotions, you know, right when it was released are very raw, but also the album itself is, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was mixed in a day. Oh, well, yeah, there's that too. It's very immediate. It's very raw when you listen to it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's recorded really Mm -hmm. well. So mixing wasn't, very difficult, but it's not slick. Mm-hmm. It's kind of just a no BS kind yeah. of thing. Um, it's really just, um, yeah, I did, I did rough mixes at the end of the session. And even though I went back and did a proper mix with Mitch mm-hmm. Easter, who I worked on the record with, um, who's done a lot of great things over the years, um, I ended up preferring my rough mixes because they were just a little more humble mm-hmm. and yeah. down to earth. There's almost no effects on anything um, it, unless it went down during the recording process. So it's it could have been a much more slick mm-hmm. and much more produced album, but that's that's not what I really um, wanted. And I took a chance that that would be okay. And hey, let's base the fact that I now mm-hmm. realize from the feedback I got that people are more attached to this album than really any of my other solo albums. People like my other solo mm-hmm. albums and even love them, but I get people talking to me about this record almost every day. And that's unique. Mm-hmm. So I think that the that's a lesson for all of us out there who do music production mm-hmm. that you don't have to do all this stuff to music if the mood if the mood is there you can just record it and it will be okay. I mm. think a tough rush, rush uh, roughness kind of adds character to it. You could say it, yeah, or, or at least it doesn't add an unwanted character. Like mm-hmm. if I'd mixed yeah. it all slick, there have been other effects and and it would have brought in some slick stuff, you know, <laughs> that, like, for, for, to use a technical term, uh, that maybe would have obscured the fact that I'm, you know, I'm just putting my heart on my sleeve. So sonically, my heart is kind of on my sleeve on this record. It's very cool. And so what does it mean to revisit this album 18 years or so later with this tour? Well, I think it's, uh, it's good therapy. It's very strange because some of the things that I was writing about, which, which won't necessarily 
be the reason that people bond with the song. Once once someone listens to a song, they put their own story into it, right? Mm-hmm. Whatever song it is. And um, but you know, breakups and things like that that I went through. That's my own personal stuff, and um, going back into those emotions, it's funny the 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 feelings are still there, but I'm in a better place. So mm-hmm. it's kind of actually it's it's oddly that's quite good therapy. It seem it would seem like going back and dragging this up would be not something that is quite is necessary or anything like that. But it's actually been quite um, been quite positive. Would you say nostalgic? No, because I didn't like those times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so not a. So it would be like no nostalgic. Yeah. Like, ah, no. <laughs> that's a good, good no way. way. <laughs> I think. Um, do you really feel like you go back into those um, places? Do you remember the the spaces, the physical, you know, people and presence that you felt when you were um, in the process of making this ac- album? Maybe not quite in such a sensory way, but in yeah. an emotional way, yes. I definitely go back into those head spaces for the three or four minutes of the song. And then I get out of there, <laughs> come back for air. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about the show tonight. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. a show tonight. There's a show tonight. It's yeah. at 7.30 at the Temaqua. Temaqua yeah. Foundation. Okay. Mm-hmm. I've heard that name pronounced like a... Yeah. Some people say Temaqua. I've heard that said. Mm-hmm. I, I said, looking at it on paper, I said Timakua, but now Timakua sounds right to me. I'm going to go with yours. It, it's also dependent on where in Florida you grow up, because yeah. I'm from the north, and it's pronounced Tamuquin there for Whoa. some reason. Because I did see that same name in some places in Jacksonville. I was yeah. in Jacksonville last night. So what does that, that name mean? That is uh, one of the native tribes who were As in I Florida, yeah. pre-Columbian societies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's... It's also a variation of that name is kind of a name for Florida, like like a oh. pre-colonial like name is for it like the region. Yeah, is the people who live yeah. there they name the region mm-hmm. after themselves, as it were. So, for anyone outside of someone who's taken fourth grade social studies in Florida, uh-huh. it, it it doesn't have much meaning. But mm-hmm. you know, well, it's got it's got meaning. We just have to yeah. we folks like me who are out of town mm-hmm. just have to come and. Dig for it a little yeah. bit. So I'm glad I had to have the explanation. But yeah, so you've got your show there tonight at 7.30. Yes. Um, if, if people were curious about it, they could go to my website and mm-hmm. information would be there if they were interested in that kind yeah. of thing. That or the uh, Temaqua Arts Foundation website has a nice little write-up oh, of great. the show. Yeah, it, it's um, um, all ages, open to anyone. I mm-hmm. will say that. <laughs> it yes. will be good. Yes. Um, so yeah, you, and this is the last show of the East coast tour. Yep. I have and a flight so, at like six tomorrow morning to go back to <laughs> Seattle and work in my studio oh, oh. because I'm a crazy person. So, you know, just a little, little change of pace there. Music but at the same stops. time, there's only one direct flight on, on, on my airline of choice mm-hmm. between Orlando and Seattle per day. And it happens to be at six in the morning. So, but okay. I took it. So I'm a crazy person. Okay. You know, <laughs> you know, just. Directly after the show, get some rest and get up. Of course. You know. So you've had a pretty long and treasured career and mm-hmm. you've met a lot of people. And there was and one, played with. And played with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. There's one specific story I want to talk about though. Oh. And this is according to your Wikipedia page, you've met Bill Nye the Science Guy and you were on an episode of that show. True. Uh the posies those Shows were filmed in Seattle, and the Posies were one of them. They would have a musical guest quite frequently. Mm -hmm. They would basically make a music video uh, on the spot for a song. Basically, like, the premise would be that a a known artist would give one of their songs, and they would work on it with the writing team to rewrite the lyrics Mm -hmm. uh, to include the scientific theme of that specific episode. Ours was Ocean Exploration. Mm-hmm. So we 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 re-recorded uh, the vocals in the studio using the, these new lyrics all about ocean exploration and <laughs> deep sea creatures and and the technology needed to go down into the ocean deep and then we shot a video uh, at the studio in the end with him there he was there mm-hmm. um, he's I don't think he's in the video I think the video is just us green screening like running around in scuba gear okay. <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm sure I have seen this at some point because oh. growing up, you know, mm. pretty much all science teachers would, you know, they didn't want to do much. They put on an episode of Bill Nye. And so right. 
our entire Problem generation has, sure has got that somewhere deep in and our you've memories. You've participated in the education of kids all over America. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, uh, our, our song was factual. That's all I can say. <laughs> Did you learn anything new about uh, marine life? Um, in, in, or scuba gear, for that matter. Well, I think it wasn't. Stu- I think it was all stuff that I already knew. But if mm. it, if it, uh, let's say that if it sparked the curiosity in the younger person, mm. our job would be done. That was yeah. good. Job well done. Another mm. thing is, uh, Ringo Starr covered one of your tracks at one point. True that. How did you work with him closely on that, or was that just a uh, just kind of out of the blue? Totally out of the blue. How did that feel? Super weird. I mean, it's great. I mean, uh, it was just, it was a real surprise. I mean, the, in the sense that the record wasn't out yet. Uh, I was in Los Angeles with my bandmate, John, mm-hmm. who, you know, he and I wrote all the songs, have written all the songs in the Posies catalog. Um, and we are the two singers, etc. And we got, we were at our record company offices and they received a call having heard we're in town and we were invited to go to this management company office. This guy, Peter Asher, who's pretty well known, Mm -hmm. managed Linda Ronstadt and blah, blah, blah. And maybe produced her records too. Anyway, uh, so, oh, Peter Asher, that's a big name. So uh, they said they had something they wanted to share with us and they didn't say what it was. So we just drove over there in our rental car and (laughs) somebody sat us in a conference room and they put on a tape in the stereo in there and out came Ringo's voice a voice that you know his voice is quite distinctive mm-hmm. yeah it, 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 he's got a, a woody friendly <laughs> a voice that you've heard in a million songs you know I grew up with my mom's Beatles record so that was immediately identifiable and you know just kind of melted our minds it'd be like I mean um, I don't know it would be like if you had like a, a like a Facebook post that you've written and I don't know, who's your favorite, I don't know, author, artist, actor, whatever. Uh, you know, like if Haruki Murakami liked my Facebook post. Not only Dr. liked Seuss. it, but like yeah. quoted it. And, or even, or like there's a tape of like him reading it aloud. You're like, what? <laughs> it just wouldn't make any sense, <laughs> right? Um, so it, it just was, seems so far-fetched. And yet, you know, cool things can happen. Yeah. You know, that, that's like when Diplo tweeted at me. Yeah. I'll never forget that oh, moment. Well, yeah, that, 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 that was wild. Almost surreal. Yeah. It's like a- yeah, so, no. Well, you see, you, you've, you've tasted some of this. <laughs> <laughs> you know we know what it's all about. The, the, the minor fame of a C-list Orlando celebrity. <laughs> that's wow. That was really? a real... That, 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 that's myself, you know. You know, um, you know I, I, I've been in one article. I, well, oh. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't know enough about uh, Orlando culture, to, but I, I myself would probably put you higher than C-list. But, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But then again, I don't really have the authority to do that, but <laughs> you got my vote. All right. So do you have any final thoughts? Uh, I'm just, you know, glad that I made it through this entire tour <laughs> without uh, any real issues and had a great time and love uh, coming to the area. You know, like... My band, The Posies, played here in 1993 mm-hmm. um, at the station in Fern, Bar- Fern Park okay. uh, with the Cranberries opening for us. Oh, wow. And then we didn't come back for like 20 years, basically. More. Mm-hmm. We didn't come back for like 23 years. <laughs> and then we came back on our last uh, album and, and played at Park Avenue CDs. And that's been great because basically kind of like got Florida back into the mix. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's, it's a great state. It's got... They really, in certain ways, should have divided Florida into like twenty different states. Oh yeah, every single part is radically different and has something cool going on. Yeah, I'm from Jacksonville, and uh, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm in a different country you sometimes. Can, you can divide us based on our pronunciation of uh, Timikwa. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put that issue through the house and see how they vote on it. And, uh, <laughs> this Florida, that Florida, mm-hmm. and the other Florida would be the new yeah. names I propose. Well. Thank you for coming back to the yeah, station. So and much. anytime you're in Florida, shoot us an email. We'd love to have you back. With pleasure. Thank you so All much. Right. Thank you both. Thank you.